All right, welcome to today's Wellness Wednesday. Um, our webinar today is by Mark Cook, and we're excited to jump in with him today on strategy for everyone. But before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Remember that your five points of health promotion activity will be available on your account at myoriant.com later today. There's also the questions and chat panel right there in front of you. So feel free to interact with us, ask any questions of Mark and um, let us know your thoughts if you have any as we go through this and we will um, be sure to answer them. If for some reason we can't answer them during the presentation, we'll follow up with you through email after the fact. So, all right, well, just to, just to jump in, we have Mark Cook back with us again. You remember he was with us last month as well, and today he's presenting to us on strategy. This is an occupational wellness series that Mark is doing for us, and he's going to um, add on to last month's information with some new, new stuff for us today. Um, to introduce Mark, he is a successful business executive, a Amazon and New York Times best selling author. He's a speaker and a consultant who's led over 4,000 teams um, through his career, and we're just really honored to have him here with us today. So I'm going to get out of the way and just turn it over to Mark and uh, um, let him run with it. Thank you so much, Ann. It's good to be back with you. Uh, as I mentioned last time, my career has been spent investigating in many different types of research, empirical with some of the leading researchers in the world, and also anecdotal and qualitative interviews where we dig deep sometimes for hours and hours and full days in someone's work and in their leadership and what's going on. And one of the, the unexpected results in studying leadership, the people that are leading the other doers and the workers, was that strategy seemed to often be seen as a leader activity and not an activity that everyone was involved with. And this is a big problem when it comes to both productivity, success, exceptional results that I've focused on, and yes, wellness. All, none of us need a study to think about how we feel at work once in our career, back a long time ago maybe, when we had the instinct to do what we wanted, but then we also had that more mature desire, that reward system, both emotionally and monetarily, trying to get us to do what the company was paying us to do. And when we're in a situation where we're not exactly in a position to do what we think we want to do, and the direction and the path to success is not clear, so therefore we don't know what the company wants us to do in all manners, then we feel a little uneasy at first. And if it continues, we become very uneasy to the point of distress. And so it's important for all of us to change our mindset, to have a, a paradigm shift, as Stephen Covey used to say, and rethink who owns strategy. We need to feel at all levels, as long as we're a full-time person, part of the organization, even a part-time person that is committed for a long period of time, if we're part of the organization, we should be part of the strategy. We should understand what it's about. So what I'm going to share with you today is something I call the strategy optimizer. And the reason I call it that is because you're going to hear some words that you've heard literally thousands of times in the workplace, but I'm going to add an extra spin on them that actually returns us back to some of the original meanings of the word. So we're not going to get too fancy. We're not going to, to present all of the findings from the Harvard, Yale, and Stanford leaders I've worked with that, that sometimes even took us away from the basic meanings of some of these strategic elements. We're going to go back to what they really meant most of the time. So think of it like this. We're going to use this metaphor a lot in the next hour. If you are someone who doesn't come to work and get to do whatever you want, which is most of us, and we don't have a clear direction, it's almost like we're in a fog. It's no wonder that 40 to 60% of workers are not actively engaged in their work because 
They literally don't know what to actively be engaged with. The bullets are on their job description. The leaders think they should understand, but the communication has come, but not been comprehended. And so they feel like they're in a fog. And I think almost every one of us has felt this way. And so yet again, we'll talk about the windfall metaphor as well, where the original meaning of windfall was not the same as the current meaning of exceptional gain from a surprising source. The original meaning was that of a bounty of fruit blown from the trees by a surprising storm. And what we're inviting each of you to do, no matter whether you're a part-time, long-time employee, or whether you're a middle manager or a doer expert, whatever you, wherever you find yourself in work, even if you're one of the top executives, but find yourself with a CEO that makes all the shot, takes all the shots, then you need to see yourself as a surprising storm, a way to get the strategy back on track and not just be subservient to what the leaders say. I want to start out with uh, a story about a gentleman I interviewed as part of a, a multi-faceted uh, research uh, effort. Dr. Brad Parkinson, a long time ago, was a Stanford professor, and, and he still does some of that work, but he became quickly a rocket scientist. And we all kid about the rocket scientists, and we think that no one, is, no one actually does that work, but Brad actually does that work. And so the government was doing a big project to try to build a new way to navigate planes and rockets and everything that moves. And they called on Brad as three of the smartest scientists were failing and floundering in their project. They couldn't get the project up and running because they were doing simulation proof. And when they would test it in reality, it just wouldn't behave the same. And so the government specifically the Air Force called Brad Parkinson, one of, the, one of the top leadership members of the Air Force at the time, called him. And with some concern of some of his counterparts, wanted to, to give Brad a chance to give a proposal. So they called him Brad to give a proposal. And he came in. And instead of trying to simulate performance, he said, look, really what we need to do, if we can create a system that will land five rockets in a fairly small hole in the ground some distance away, you know that my system or my team's system has worked well. There just will be no disputing it. And if after, the, in the short run, we land those five rockets in the hole, maybe years, maybe a decade or more, if we could create not just for military or travel, but if we could create for every citizen, not just of the United States, but for the world, an open free utility to help them find the people and places that they love, then this project is worth doing. And he, he got a round of applause and he left the meeting. And one of the generals that was not excited about the project who wanted to buy planes with the budget and and modify and improve those planes came up to him and literally pointed in his chest quite hard and said this project will never happen and I will make sure of it and he he had some resistance luckily he had leadership that cleared the path so I want to talk a little bit about paths now and and I want to before I continue with the story of of Dr. Parkinson I want to just remind you the context of how he fits in my professional life. So last time we talked about how I'd done nine large studies that related to work and leadership and mostly focused all of them on achieving exceptional results through exceptional work habits. This time I just wanted to share with you some of the what we meant by results. You have two sides to everything I've researched, the things that cause or predict results that are better and then you have better results or worse results and so these are some of the the characteristics or qualities of the results that we measured some were really poor in all of these ways some were really exceptional in all these ways and some were part of the status quo and so it, we very carefully could tie certain behaviors and certain actions 
to these better results. One thing to note that's interesting is that we were never able to tie, in nine studies, never able to tie a person's traits or personality characteristics to better or worse results. Now, I realize that these are all the rage, and I don't really have an answer for that other than very, very bright people in the world have studied traits and characteristics and their effect on whether you can do better work or be part of a strategy or be a leader. And they've all come to the same conclusion that we came to, that it's not who you are that matters. It is what you do that matters. And so to be more engaged in an endeavor or a strategy within your company is mostly up to you, even if your boss is not asking you to do it. So, for example, in, in Dr. Parkinson's project, the first project said nothing about helping citizenry or humanity. It just was trying to prove the technology, the work on their side of the table. When, when Dr. Parkinson presented, he went to reality, he went to the other side of the table. In fact, he went outside the office into the real world and said, we can produce a meaningful result in the short run. But then he went further and he said, our strategy, our passion is for the long term. If you look out there to the right, you'll see that it fits his story quite well. He said, we want to help all of humanity with this project. It's got such a large budget. It's got so much effort that it will, it will entail. We want everyone to benefit. And so, in fact, they lost, they ended up launching their first rocket into space with a payload that has the first satellite that would become part of this system. Now, it was ironic because the navigation system they were using was old because theirs didn't exist yet. And they'd lost 11 rockets down in the California Gulf and they were nervous about this launch. And in fact, they made it 11,000 miles into space with this satellite. And they proceeded to 24, and today they're 36. And of course, all of you know by now, you've guessed, that he was the father of the GPS navigation system. And his teams of five different, completely different types of teams had to do things like develop software, develop new hardware, invent ways to get the rocket that high, new navigation, even before they created their ultimate navigation. One of the great inventions that came out of their work is just making its way into the world now, and it's called Pathway in the Sky. Pathway in the Sky is a way to get planes off the ground. After they landed those five rockets in a hole, they started proving this ability, where if you see a storm like this, where there's fog and mist, and you're trying to get through something like a canyon or, a, or fly a plane or something low, you can't fly the plane safely, even with lasers and all the technology that has existed so far. What GPS does is it comes from the heavens. It doesn't have to pierce through the fog. It locates things on Earth in such detail, far more detail than, than Apple has paid our phone to, to perceive. The system is made to to predict where things are within a millimeter, within a pencil lead. And so they can take that accuracy and technology in a, in a larger project like a plane, and they can literally paint a pathway through a canyon, even if there's fog. Now you and I all use this every day. Every time you turn on your GPS or let it run um, with someone's permission, it goes 11, actually now 13,000 miles into space and then communicates across continents to tell you where you are. Now, in spite of the fact that this amazing system, it is a billion dollar a year budget system, which would frighten some of you accountants. But as Dr. Parkinson is quick to point out, the industry and the revenue that the United States has, has received because of this project has dwarfed the expense. It's one of the most lucrative projects ever to be run. Not only that, but the science community voted it the most valuable space endeavor ever taken, more than the Mars landing, more than the, the moon, the men on the moon, more than anything, because it affects all of humanity. Because in fact, his vision did come to pass. 
every citizen of the world can use our GPS system to tell where they are. Now, with all this investment and all this effort and all of Dr. Parkinson's team's collaboration and cooperation and an occasional fighting, none of it works unless you have one thing that you, the user, have to provide. Now, think about that for a minute. Some of you will guess quickly and some will wonder what I'm leading to, but it's quite obvious. Unless you put a destination into your GPS system, it is no good. All it can tell you is where you are. It cannot tell you where you're going. And so it becomes like a vision. And without that, as we return to the workplace, and remember his was a very real workplace in that Air Force environment, as they worked through their project, that vision carried everyone emotionally and intellectually and cooperatively to the destination. And without a clear vision, they would be operating in fog. And so he taught us the power of a good vision. We're going to talk a little bit about a mission and a new element you might, a couple of elements you might think about when you think about a mission. And objectives and the difference between what objectives could mean in your organization and what a goal could mean to you as an individual. And so let's start out with purpose, which we often talk about in strategy. And we mix all these words up, which is one of the big problems in strategy. The word mission and purpose become the same thing and values becomes kind of mixed up in it. And vision becomes kind of a longer term version of all those things. And, and, and there's a lot of confusion in the rank and file, the people in the cubes and offices, what we actually mean by these things, or if we mean anything or care about them at all. And, and yet, if we're clear and authentic with these things, they can be quite powerful. Let me give you an example. This is a simple, I, I don't know if it's true. I can't even find the reference for it anymore. But this is a story that I love that points out very obviously the, the power of purpose. Now keep in mind that we in all of our studies, especially when it came to leadership and strategy, we measured up to 600 variables. The, 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 the top variable that affected results most powerfully was actually a passion for purpose in one study. And in my subjective uh, qualitative interviews, it's been clear that purpose is powerful and necessary to create the best result. And so once there was a university president and she was excited to build the new administration building. And so she got, invited the architects and the planners in and they had the typical meetings where they put the blueprints down on the table and progress through the project with much difficulty, with much effort and much success over the process. Anyone who's remodeled a house could imagine how big it would be of the project to build a communication building like this where everything is administered from. So they start out with this project and, and it got to the end and they were near success. And it was time to put the sidewalks in. And they had one of their last typical meetings and the architect and planners came in and and spoke to her and said, Ms. President, it's time to put the, the sidewalks in and we'd like to put these down and we've designed them. Here are the blueprints. Here's where they should go. We've done a lot of these in campuses all over the world. And this is what we would suggest. And all she did was glance at the blueprint and that president looked up and she said to those planners and architects, I don't want any sidewalks. In fact, all I want you to do is plant the grass, put the sprinklers in, and come back in nine months. They were dumbfounded. They had no idea. They, well, you, you need to have sidewalks. We, we planned this carefully. We know where they should go. We, we're the experts at this. We've done it all over the world. She had to say a second time, I don't want sidewalks. I want you to plant the grass, put the sprinkling system in, and come back in nine months. They couldn't believe it. It was a ridiculously unwise decision that she had made, so they thought. But then when they came, came back nine months later, you can imagine what they saw. They saw paths like this worn in the grass. And the meeting was very, very short that day. The planners and archi architects came to the meeting and, and she came to the office a little late and all she said was, now I want you to put the sidewalks where the paths are worn, please. 
And that was the end of the meeting. This is a story that points out the importance of thinking about what you're really doing with your work and what it's really for, who it really serves. Were those sidewalks serving a beautiful campus? Were they serving the president? Were they serving helicopter pilots that would look down and see how organized and smart they were? Or were they, were they serving the people that wanted to connect with the people and find the places that they needed to go? And of course, the answer is the latter, and that wise president showed that. So what we do with clients when we do a strategy session, we talked a little bit about this last time, where we, um, we present to them a number of researched human needs. These are well-researched by about a dozen researchers. They did things to find out the basic human needs and the more advanced human needs that exist in humanity and they did things like connect people with with heart rate monitors and skin temperature monitors and fMRI machines and they presented them with scenarios and pictures and words and all sorts of things in their various studies and some were called needs and some were called wants and some were desires and some were reflexes and some were positive emotions and whatever the study was if you look at the labels that I've simply put on top of these or borrowed from one of the better studies you can see that these you, uh, that, that you can't read the, the synonyms below them, and that's fine. That's kind of on purpose. But, but I just want you to pay attention to those labels on the top, and, and you can see that those find their way in your life. I've had a, a recent health experience, and so wellness has been very important to me the last two months. Some of us have had break-ins or we feel un, insecure in our job, and so we have security issues. And these 12 needs – show up in our lives all the time. Some of them compete, some of them complement, and they make life interesting because they rarely show up alone. But they usually show up together and you can pick one that's primary. And so we, we give people an, a choice between what should happen in the future using that list. And even the same executives at the same company, when we ask them to do it individually first, end up disagreeing quite dramatically with what they're actually trying to accomplish for the human beings that they call a target market. And so we focus on seeing rather than writing. Instead of having a writing contest or wordsmithing the perfect English in a vision statement, we don't do vision statements like that. We make sure that we can see them with some of the most important elements that you see in a scene or a story or in our episodic memory as we live life. Now, when it comes to mission, this was really interesting to me because mission, the mission is always kind of the same thing as the purpose. And, and yet in my studies, I found that the most successful people, most successful teams and companies actually see the distinction between mission and purpose. Sure, mission can be a cause, but it has a shorter term life than a purpose. The purpose of your company lasts the whole path, the whole, the whole way to the horizon and beyond. But a mission is something that multiple teams can get behind, and it's a tangible accomplishment. This gentleman named Leif Babin points out a really great example. He talks about an example He's a Navy, a former Navy SEAL. And, and when they went and tried to protect a city in Afghanistan, they were given the assignment to go and take that city and protect the inhabitants from the recent um, invasion. And, and they were going to do it with an army team. And he's in, of course, he's a Navy SEAL. And what their assignment was, was to cover for the army team to get back to, to or cover for the Afghan police force to get back to their homes. And so they were on the opposite side of the army team and both were covering for that Afghan troop. And they saw them arrive back where they needed to arrive. And so of course they took their troops home. And he got a call by his leader and he was brought into the office and his commanding officer just yelled at him like only army people and football coaches can do. And he, he yelled at him and he was so confused because they'd accomplished his, their mission, he thought. And he learned something harsh from the, his leader that day that he never forgot and used in his own leadership. And he, he calls it cover and move leadership. And he said that what happened is that his, 
his um, leader said, what happened to the army team? And he said, I have no idea. I don't know what happened to him. That wasn't part of our assignment. And he said, it was always part of your assignment. You always look at missions as from a multiple team. You take care of each other and you cover and you move with each other. You failed this assignment. And he got some harsh penalties for that, actually. So mission is something that we do because we can cooperate and we can work with each other more than anything else alive on earth. It's interesting. If you take 15 apes, the great apes that are closest genetically and intellectually to a human being, and you put them in a stadium like this, they will kill each other if there's any strangers. And yet every Saturday we show up to stadiums and cheer our teams on and there's some fights and some, some un inhuman behavior, surely. But for the most part, 100,000 people can just drive home slowly and no, have no accidents. We know how to cooperate. So a mission is something to be accomplished by multiple teams, not something written. Now, to, to finish our time together, I just want to talk about one of the other elements, and it's, and it's about working within a single team, not multiple teams. This is our dog, Coda. And when he was a little younger, after 27 years, I said, yes, we will adopt Coda and we'll raise him. And the, the gentleman holding him is my second to last son who wrote a major research paper and interviewed me in order to sell me on getting the dog. And of course, I fell in love with the dog more than anyone. So we took him to the beach and we, we were nervous. He wasn't trained yet. So we tethered him. We found a dog beach and there weren't a lot of people around. It was off season. And so we tethered him to this stake. We hammered the stake in the ground and we're right in the middle of the beach, not near the water at the top, and people were walking near the water or up near the boardwalk. So we were, we had our, our space to ourselves until all of a sudden, an older woman brought her dog right towards us. And as she brought her dog right towards us, our coda did what you'd expect. He took off. And even though he, we had thought he had understood where his place was, he started to run unknowing when his time was up. Sure enough, when he reached right before that woman and her dog, the leash snapped him back and I ran over. I thought he was dead. He just laid there lifeless and I was so sad. And of course, we picked him up and he was okay finally. And we took him off that and we, we kept close tabs on him. And as I went through some of my research on, on leading a team, I thought of my friend Bruce Jensen and some of the things that he had taught me in our interviews and, and research together. And a long leash by a leader is something we say a lot. And a long leash is not freedom. And latitude, we say a lot in business too, is not ownership. And there's nothing that says a leader cannot cooperate and guide just like a teammate can and influence without restraint an employee to do what should be done for customers and internal customers. In fact, my friend Bruce, he led one of the most successful teams in healthcare. His, his marketing team was, when it was working for the third largest chain in, in, in the world, hospital chain. And he said they always got the highest marks because what they did is every, every year, twice a year, they would get together and they would negotiate each other's objectives and goals. And they turned the, the team-wide goals into objectives, they would call them. And they would use these to combine their success. And they would incent instead of individual commission or individual um, bonuses, they paid a team bonus. And so if everyone's goals and the common objectives were met, then they would get paid more than if some didn't. And so they began to help each other and work with each other rather than just focus on their own project and hope it was complementary and, and sometimes compete as teams can do. And so they would, they would achieve their objectives and he felt that's the way that a team should be led. In my work, I've found that there are many common activities that accompany this type of behavior. And just to finish, I want to point out one thought that 
was also one of the most interesting things that, that I found in the work on strategy and, and leadership. The word passion, one interviewee pointed out, did not originally mean a sacrifice for others, while it is that, um, but it actually meant a life sacrifice for others. And then it became what we all think of it today is an extremely strong emotion. So it's weakened quite a bit, this, this word that we call passion, and still it's a very strong word. And so when we, when we point out that you've got to find within your strategy a passion for purpose by finding that, that path that goes along to success and what you're trying to achieve in the future, you have to give everyone an opportunity and find ways for them to sacrifice not only for each other as the team, but sacrifice for the work, because that's what will build the strong, strong emotion that we call passion. So that ends my time. Um, I would point out that the word goal is something that each of us should make something sacred out of. The word goal could be differentiated in your organization from the word objective. And it could be a personal version of all of this. Because when a person finds passion and is willing to do something that they are excited about, they outperform anyone that is unexcited. And so if you can align the individual's personal passion and their personal goal with what the team's trying to accomplish, and then that team's objectives with what the multiple teams are trying to accomplish in the shorter term, two year, four year mission. And then finally, make sure that we're always paying attention to the primary need of what we're trying to give to customers. And then when we run out of, uh, when we accomplish that mission, what we can do is we can look to the secondary and the tertiary needs that we can add to complement that, that benefit to our customers. And that becomes a new mission. And so every two to four years, we shouldn't just rewrite the mission. We should rethink the mission and re, re, redefine it. And the, the key performance indicators will change to create these differentiators and these advantages that we bring that are unique, that put our thumbprint on our purpose, unlike our competitors, where we find that secondary need and that tertiary need, and we accentuate them within the primary purpose. And if you connect an individual all the way through that path to that vision, you've really done something. And of course it's difficult. And it takes work on both the project side and on the people side where culture lives. And so this, these are the two sides that we accentuate as we go through these four steps with other people, all the way from vision to goal. I wish you luck and, and I wanna encourage you to feel like you're part of your company strategy, to go give your voice, have a voice, tell your leaders what you think, what you see out there in the market or internally with other deliverers and, and be part of it instead of waiting and thinking that they're going to do it all. Thank you so much, Anne, appreciate it. Mark, thank you so much for all that you've shared with us today about strategy and vision and, and in helping us live our best selves professionally and in our work. Um, Mark and his um, partner and wife, Anika, are the creators of the Windfall series. And if you want to learn more from them, you can find them at thewindfallseries.com. We'll put a link to their um, website on, our, on your account on our website as well so you can access them. And we really appreciate all the knowledge and expertise that you guys have shared with us today. Um, Mark will be back with us one more time next month, September 11th. So keep your eye out for um, that information to be coming out soon about next month's um, presentation as well. But thank you, Mark, so you much for joining us today. We'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs>